So this is my linear approximation to that nonlinear term. So what I can do then next is sub in that nonlinear, sorry, that linear version of it. So R A H T T is then equal to R F naught minus, and I replace that. So root H is plus a half. So now I'm back to a point where I'm very comfortable. I've got an ODE. Every single term in this ODE now is linear. You can see that because R and A are constants, dh by dt, R times F0, R is a constant, F0 is a linear term, HS is a constant, F is a constant, and there's a linear term this minus HS. So taking care of the non-linearity. So I'll give you, for those that came late, a chance to catch up. For those of you that are already at this point and, and on pace with me, take a minute, set this differential equation to zero, subtract, and form deviation variables. So divide it at steady state, then subtract, and then isolate deviation variables. So I'll give you a minute to do that while the rest of you catch up. side is zero, the right hand side then says R times F naught S, the steady state value of the inlet flow, minus root HS, minus 1 over 2 root HS, times HS minus HS. So that's always will happen when you get a non-linear term that is linearized, you always get this sort of simplification of those terms to zero. Okay. The deviation variable is already coming in in your linear approximation, so when you set that to steady state, you'll get that cancellation hs minus hs multiplied to zero. So then in the next line, when we do our subtraction, we get ra times h minus hs t. My rf naught term forms a new deviation variable, R F naught minus F naught S. My root H S terms will cancel out. So this is a constant in the same, uh, appears twice. 
So the subtraction of that will make that constant go away. And then this term here is zero, so we're simply saying this term over here minus zero, so we're in fact just recover that term one over two times root hs. H minus hs. So I'll write that O E then over on this board for people that can't see it at the back. So we're now then back, this, this process over here is back to a familiar process to take the fast transform of those deviation variables and create a transfer function. <coughs> it's a constant. So minus hs, so you subtract from this line from this line. Minus hs, minus minus hs. <coughs> Can you do uh, A minus B first and then sub in your F of H? You can do A minus B and then sub in your linear approximation. Oh, we're still? But uh, it's easier this way, I okay. argue, because you get that uh, deviation set to zero over there. But in either, either way you can do it, yeah. Okay, so notice we've not done anything different in our process other than sub in a linear approximation to the nonlinear term. Everything after that is, is, uh, should be very comfortable. Okay. So when you get this ODE, then in deviation variables, you can construct your class transform, and I'll leave it to you to, to do that. It's h dash of s divided by f naught dash of s, and you can get a transfer function over there on the right hand side. So it's simple, uh, simply using the response table box. The next topic I'd like to consider is we're going to step this up a bit now and consider systems well now we've only considered systems with one input and one output, but most systems of practical interest have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So let's consider how we would derive a class transfer function for such systems. And they occur in many, many instances in a chemical process. You'll we'll see this. Let's just take a simple example that you're familiar with already. And that's this case where you've got an inlet feed 
a valve that comes to some heat exchanger. And we measure a flow there, let's just call this flow F1. We take a branch off that feed, have another valve, another flow, F2 here. And then we blend that mixture up again. And what we're measuring over here on the outlet is temperature. So in 4A, you'll learn about this. You've up to now in your heat exchanger course simply considered your heat exchanger having a flow in, a cold entry stream, and then you're using steam or some hot stream to heat that, and then you've got it leaving. But a practical heat exchanger that, that we'll learn about in 4A to make that heat exchanger actually work and, and work well, we will almost always have a bypass around it. Now you're familiar with this system. This system is exactly what's in your home. You just may not see it this way. Out here my input, this is your water from the lake. Lake Ontario comes in, there's a heat exchanger in your home, your cold stream branches off before that, and this mixing point is your tap or your faucet or your shower head. And then there's a the temperature. And you're manipulating this flow F1 and flow F2 to get the desired temperature. So two inputs, one output in this example. Now, if we were considering this as a transfer function, our goal is to relate the output to the input. So we've, up to now, we've only developed transfer functions for one output related to one input. So if we did that, you can easily go ahead and find the transfer function related temperature to flow one. That's very straightforward. Considering F2 constant. So you could go derive this transfer function considering F2 constant. Very straightforward to do that. You can also go derive the transfer function that relates the temperature to F2, assuming F1 constant. Okay, so both, I would encourage you to do this. In fact, this will be a question on the midterm where you go and derive that transfer function. It will relate to heat capacities, flow rates through the heat exchanger, heat transfer coefficients, all the stuff that you know from your prior courses. So that's an easy first principles ODE to derive and then get the transfer function for it. So let's call that G1 of S. The second transfer function that will relate temperature to the flow rate two, let's call that G2 of S. So in your derivation for G1 of S, the only things that are varying are your flow in, F1, and your temperature out, T. Because you consider F2 constant. The heat exchanger is constant, the heat transfer area is constant, the heat transfer coefficient is constant, the heat capacity of the fluid and density of the fluid are constant. The only things varying are the inlet flow to the heat exchanger and the outlet temperature. When you go ahead and derive the second transfer or uh, transfer as a Laplace transform the <coughs> function, the only output variable of consideration is the temperature, and because it considered F1 constant, this is actually a very easy transfer function to derive. It simply is a blending of this hot stream with this time varying F2. So that second transfer function F2 varies, F1 remains constant. And we would expect and, and know then that the heat from those two streams will simply blend in an additive way. So we can write then quite intuitively, it's not, not going to be any surprise to us that this 
total transfer function of the system is then the sum of the two individual parts. So the total temperature is going to now be affected by two inputs, G1 and G2. We would expect that G of S then is equal to G1 of S multiplied by F1 dash of S. So notice what I've done over here is I've multiplied this denominator at input F1 dash out over to the right hand side multiplied by G1 of S. That tells me what the effect on temperature is for a change in the inlet flow at F1. But that temperature is also going to be affected by the second time variable <coughs> input, F2. So G2 of S multiplied by F2 dash of S. So what we've done here, notice, is we've added two transfer functions. And in general, we can represent this in what we call block diagram form. We've already seen block diagrams last class. Let's introduce them again and, and visualize them. Block diagrams are a great way to visualize a process. If I have my input F1, we can consider that input coming into some system, G1 of S. And there's going to be an output. So that flow comes in into the system, which has some sort of dynamics, G1. But we also have flow F2. So F2 dash of S comes into another system, G2. And these two are going to combine. We'll use this notation, we'll see this several times in this course, we're combining these two signals and we will explicitly emphasize that it's an additive combination by using a plus symbol over here and a plus symbol over there. And what leaves that then is T for this, T dash of this. We've got essentially two parallel <coughs> events occurring, and then we're combining them in that mixing point to get the output temperature. Last time in series, we saw, for example, the tank height followed by the valve, and we multiplied the transfer functions because those two systems are in series. So when systems are in series, we multiply successive transfer functions. When systems are in parallel, we can add the transfer functions. So this device of illustration, of illustrating the system over here is called a block diagram. And we like to use block diagrams because they help conceptualize what's going on in the process. We could always draw a PNID as I've drawn over here. So here's my valves, my flows, F1, F2, my heat exchange, and my temperature. <laughs> And that indicates the system quite well, but uh, from a conceptual point of view for process control, we like to use block diagrams. And here's one example of a block diagram. And one important point of block diagrams I'd like to point out is that the implicit cause and effect that's shown in a block diagram. Remember we had spoken about cause and effect a few classes <coughs> back, and cause and effect is important to us. We need, or we require that. So F1 is my input, and that's my cause, and I observe an effect on the outlet temperature. F2 is an input, and this arrow indicates the causal direction to me. So causality and the direction of causality is really important to me in our work. And the block diagram's arrows indicate that for us. Okay, now we will oftentimes see these expand to a third term and a fourth term if you've got more, more than two inputs. So up to now we've just simply considered one input. Here's the first example you've seen of two inputs. If you were, for example, modeling the height in a tank, 
and you had two pipes flowing into the tank, F1 and F2, you have a transfer function that relates the height in the tank H to the two inputs F1 and F2. In the assignment, you have a question that has two inputs. The two inputs are the flow into the tank and the concentration, the inlet concentration, and that both of those two inputs will affect the output concentration. So many simple systems that we experience already have two or three inputs sometimes. So we, we have to be comfortable with this concept. So before I move on, I'd like to make sure that everyone is very comfortable with any questions. Um, what if you have a thing that's in series before the parallel? Okay. How would you multiply the transfer function by the two? <coughs> yeah, you're now say, taking this upper level where you've got two systems in series and then a parallel system, and then they combine it. Okay, so I you correctly. So this is again where block diagrams become really useful. If you have an input, let's call it U, and here's a system G1, here's an output Y1. So there's my first system, and that's in series with the second system, G2, and there's an output Y2. And then if you have another system over here, or G3, and it's got its input U2, and these combine up and get you another output. Where are we at now? Three, and here's my four. Take a minute, perhaps this might be a good example, and derive the transfer function that relates Y4 to the two inputs U1 and U2. In other words, what would that output Y4 look like when either Y1 or Y2, sorry, Y4 of S? going to be some term multiplied by u1 on this, plus another term multiplied by u2 on this. Y2 of S is the 
product of two systems in series. So it can be written as G2 of S times Y1 of S. Okay. But we also know that Y1 of S is equal to G1 of S times U1 of S. So we can now expand all of those and, and simplify a little bit. So y2 of s then can be written as g2 of s multiplied by g1 of s times u1. So simply sub, sub in at y1 of s over there. And then I'm pretty much ready to write y4 of s. <coughs> break it down into its two inputs. Y4 of S, that final output, is the summation of two separate systems. The first one is this one over here, in fact, G2 of S, G1 of S times U1 of S. So the two transfer functions in series get multiplied together, plus the second component that makes up that output y4 is u to y3, and that's equal to g3 of s times u2 of s. So there's just a single system. So two systems in series in that first branch, and then I've got two branches in parallel coming together, and they just simply get added. So this concept of multiplication for series systems and addition for parallel systems is going to become second nature to us. Okay, and then one final important topic for today's class. So we've looked at two really important things today. Firstly, linearization, and then secondly, this concept of block diagrams and parallel systems. Let's move on to a third uh, important topic, and that's this concept of time delays. And one way to consider a time delay is recognizing that our processes in practice have many, many <coughs> real systems have large time delays, and that's mainly due to the fact that our processes are filled with pipes. So if I consider a pipe, I've got some input into that pipe that's changing with time, x of t, and I have an output leaving that pipe y of t. Now, Pipe, we can consider to simply have and behave like a hockey puck moving through that pipe. So, plug flow reactor type idea. We've just got this material moving through the pipe and leaving after a certain duration of time. So, if you wanted to illustrate that, you can do that quite, quite straightforwardly. Consider an input x of t. my input x with time, and consider this input to have the following behavior. Let's just take a look at a step, because it's such an easy one to conceptually visualize. And that step occurs at time zero. So I'm just shifting my axis to emphasize the zero. So the step <coughs> occurs at t equals zero. And we observe y of t then. y of t will have the following behavior. y of t will show the same effect. And here's 0 for reference. But then we've got this delay here. That delay, let's use a value of 15 seconds. We'll use this term theta to 
represent the amount of delay. time delays, we see them in so many places, all our processes are connected with pipes. So delays of varying duration will always be seen. And theta then is that time delay amount. Another term that you'll see for theta is simply called dead time. So both those terms, time delay, dead time are used. One way that you can look at this is if you took x of t, x of t was that input we call, and we're observing y of t, how do we relate that output y to the input x is where we're going with this section. Right? So one way to see it is y of t is equal to x of t minus t. Now that throws people a little bit. Some people expect that to be t plus t there. Take a minute and convince yourself that it should in fact be a minus. t minus t. <coughs> That step that occurred that we observed in y 15 seconds later, so then it's time zero. 15 seconds later, we observe the step in y. Well, that's equal to x at t minus theta, and if theta is 15 in this example, that is that simply re, uh, considers the event x times zero, which is that same step. Okay, so it is in fact a minus sign that's appropriate over there. Now, our goal is, there's a time domain representation of that. Our goal is obviously to find what is the equivalent of mass transform for that. In other words, we would like to write y of s is equal to something multiplied by x of s. And so if we know what that input is, x, what is our output going to be if there's a time delay of theta units? And the answer to that question is e to the minus theta s. is by taking the Laplace transform for y of t and that is equal to the Laplace transform now for what's on the right hand side of it, x of t minus theta. But I do want to emphasize something here about that. In the derivation for it, you can go read Dr. Mahler's derivation for it. It's really, really a good one. If you're looking at Seaborg, Seaborg modifies the derivation a little bit, and it's important to understand what Seaborg is doing. Seaborg will consider the Laplace transform, but they also use the step function occurring at t minus d. Okay. And the, the two derivations are really no different 
All that the step function does is, call the step function in unit step, says you have zero up to, up to a point and then you step up. So by multiplying this input by the step function, essentially what it does is it enforces the fact that the function is zero prior to the input and then after that is whatever the function ends towards. Okay, so this simply is like a switch that goes from zero to one and makes sure that the Laplace transform doesn't integrate during periods of negative time because recall the Laplace transform is only defined from time zero and onwards. So either you could go read Dr. Marlin's approach to the derivation or you could go read Seaborg's approach. The end goal comes to the same result where we can write that y of s, that output, given the input x of n, s is e to the minus theta of s. So what our goal in this course is not to go through that derivation. It's just three, four lines. I could write it up, you feel good about it, and go ahead. But that's not my goal. You can easily look it up in the textbook, and you're, um, you're going to be, have no problem interpreting it. What I do want to do, though, is let's take a look at how this is used. <coughs> so it's, this transfer function tells me what is the output y given this input x when I have a known delay of theta units. So let's see how this might look in, in an example. response is going to have some sort of discontinuity. If we have a delay in there, there's going to be somewhere in time that we're going to be doing nothing and then suddenly we're going to start to move. So we expect in our time, time representation of y to see that discontinuity. So let's see how that comes about in this example. So one way we can do this is if I put in a step input of 3 over s, we can write that y of s is 1 minus e to the minus 2s divided by 4s plus 1. And then we've got a 3 over s. That's my input. So some people like to write it at the front. Some people like to write it at the end. That's not too much. So what is that output now back in the time domain? Well, recognize and simplify a little bit over here. The first step is to 
write it out as follows. Write it as two portions. Let's just break out that numerator. So it's 3 divided by s, 4s plus 1. And then the second portion is minus 3 e to the minus 2s divided by s, 4s plus 1. So go ahead and use your table of Laplace transforms and then find what y of t is. <coughs> the first term should take you no time, the second term might have caused zero of that hesitation. Mm -hmm. Perhaps point out that will make this a whole a little easier for you. Is to take the look at look at that numerator there is three e to the minus two s. Notice that this first term here is the same term. The only thing is we take this e to the minus two s. So it's essentially this delayed portion is exactly the same as this first portion, <coughs> just shifted in time by two units. So if you can do the first part, which is not nothing, I think it's line 13 from the table in front of you. So then the second portion, that delayed portion, is simply line 13 shifted in time. is defined only during positive times. So when we convert back into the time domain, we take the same function wherever we see a t, we substitute a t minus theta, that's what I've done over there, and then secondly we multiply by the state function shifted by t. Um, that should still be subtracted. Uh, oh, that should, sorry. Yeah. Just check the line. So a few confused 
faces, that's quite okay. This is always going to be a little bit weird the first time you see it. We'll do another example next Friday and pick up with some final ideas.